Okay, Chaplain Bob Walker here. This is going to be, well, John, uh, Light of the World Ministries, John 8, 12, you know the deal. Hey, uh, we're going to do part three of Moses versus Paul. Uh, I had mentioned that King Saul, the first king of Israel, and Saul of Tarsus, the apostle, uh, were both uh, of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, Ben... B-E-N means son in Hebrew, and Benjamin means son of the right hand. Son of the right hand. Uh, most people are right-handed. So, you know, when you go to shake hands, generally it's the right hand. So, we're going to take a look at... I, I need to prove that both... King Saul and Saul of Tarsus were of the tribe of Benjamin. All right, let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 9, Old Testament. And we're going to read the account of King, future King Saul. 1 Samuel 9, verse 1. Now there was a man of Benjamin, whose name was Kish, the son of Abel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bechoroth, the son of Abhiah, a Benjamite, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a son, whose name was Saul, a choice young man and a goodly. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From his shoulders and upwards, he was higher than any of the people. He was a, evidently, he was a big, tall guy. Strong, I guess, you know. Just, uh, just the kind of king everybody would look up to, right? Verse 3, And the asses of Kish, Saul's father, was lost, were lost. And Kish said to Saul, his son, Take now one of the servants with thee, and arise, go seek the asses. And he passed through Mount Ephraim, and passed through the land of Shalisha, but they found them not. And they passed through the land of Shalom, and they were not there. And he passed through the land of the Benjamites, but they found them not. So, they're looking all over for their livestock, right? And when they came to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant that was with him, Come, and let us return, lest my father leave caring for the asses and take thought for us. You know, well, we better get back because Dad's going to be worried. More worried about us being gone than about the livestock, right? Um, verse 6. And he said unto him, Behold, now there is a city, a man of God, and he is an honorable man. All that he saith cometh surely to pass. Now let us go thither, peradventure he can show us our way that we should go. You know, everything he says comes to pass. So evidently he's like a, sounds like a prophet. We'll, we'll see, right? Then said Saul to his servant, But behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is spent in our vessels, and there is not a present to bring to the man of God. What have we? And the servant answered Saul again and said, Behold, I have here at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver that I will give to the man of God to tell us our way. If I remember the Correctly, the fourth part of a shekel of silver is about, oh, let's see, about, I don't know, 15 pounds or about six kilos. I could be wrong about, let me look that up real quick. A shekel. Oh, wait, a shekel, not a, let me check it out. I'm sorry, I was thinking of something else. A shekel is about... 11 grams. So a quarter of that is not much. About, what, 3 grams maybe? 
Uh, yeah. And for those of you that don't know it, that's about uh, a tenth of an ounce. So that would have been about uh, a silver dime back in the day, approximately. I got my shekel and talent mixed up. And by the way, a shekel was a weight. Do you know that a, a dollar was a weight also? Not a piece of paper. No, 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 no. 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 A dollar was considered, was one ounce of 90% pure silver. That was a dollar, not a piece of paper that has dollar written on it. I mean, that's Monopoly money that they're just printing. Um, and what about in the UK? What is a pound sterling? Sterling silver, a pound, was 12 troy ounces. Uh, what would a pound, what would it cost you to buy a, a pound of uh, sterling silver today? Yeah. Yeah. So a dollar was actually a unit of weight, but uh, we don't have that anymore. People think, oh, I got a hundred dollars in my pocket here. No, you don't. You got, you got pa a piece of paper or pieces of paper that says whatever. So, all right, let's uh, keep reading. 1 Samuel 9, 8. And the servant answered Saul again and said, Behold, I have here at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver that I will give to the man of God to tell us our way. I got the shekel and the talent mixed up. Ah, here we go. 1 Samuel 9, 9. Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come, and let us go to the seer, S-E-E-R. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer, because he could, I guess, because he could see or foresee the future. So they call him a seer. Then said Paul to his servant, Well said, come, let us go. So they went unto the city where the man of God was. And as they went up the hill to the city, they found young maidens going out to draw water and said unto them, Is the seer here? And they answered them and said, He is. Behold, he is before you. Make haste now, for he came today to the city. For there is a sacrifice of the people today in the high place. As soon as ye be come into the city, ye shall straightway find him before he go up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat until he come, because he doth bless the sacrifice, and afterwards they eat that be bidden. Now therefore get you up, for about this time ye shall find him. And they went up into the city, and when they were come into the city, behold, Samuel, Samuel, Samuel's got a book, right? Yeah, oh, that's right, we're reading Samuel. Samuel came out against them for to go up to the high place. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow about this time I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people, because their cry is come unto me. So even though the people had rejected the Lord as their king, the Lord is still working with everybody. You know? Uh, boy, I tell you what. I look back on my life. I'm surprised he didn't just kill me outright. Really. Uh, I, I, I am. So, yeah.
And when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said unto him, Behold the man whom I spake to thee of, the same shall reign over my people. 18. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, Tell me, I pray thee, where the seer's house is. And Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me unto the high place, for ye shall eat with me today and tomorrow. And I will let thee go and will tell thee all that is in thine heart. <laughs> Listen to this. I'm going to tell you everything you want to know. Verse 20. Now remember, Saul has not ask Samuel where the livestock is, but Samuel's about ready to tell him. And as for thine asses that were lost three days ago, set not thy mind on them. In other words, don't worry about them, for they are found, and on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on thee and all thy father's house? You know, the desire of Israel. You know, like like a rock star, right? And Saul answered and said, and said, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? And my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Where then, wherefore then speakest thou so to me? Yeah, we're, we're, we're the little tribe, and I'm, you know, we're just, we're the smallest of the small. What are you talking about? What are you talking about, dude? And Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought them into the parlor. Well, that's a long time I've heard that word, parlor. And made them sit in the chiefest place among them that were bidden, which were about 30 persons. And Samuel said unto the cook, Bring the por portion which I gave thee, of which I said unto thee, Sit it by thee. And the cook took up the shoulder, and that which was upon it, and set it upon Saul. Why a shoulder? I just thought about this. Um, have you ever heard the expression, he's got the whole world's burdens on his shoulders? I, I don't know. I don't know if that applies, but it just kind of popped into my brain. So, and Samuel said, Behold, that which is left, set it before thee, and eat. For unto this time hath it been kept for thee, since I said, I have invited the people. So Saul did eat with Samuel that day. And when they were come down from the high place into the city, Samuel communed with Saul upon the top of the house. And they arose early, and it came to pass about the spring of the day that Samuel called Saul to the top of the house, saying, Up, that I may send thee away. And Saul arose, and they went out, both of them, he and Samuel abroad. And as they were going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servant pass on before us. And he passed on. You know, tell the servant to go. Just keep going. You know, go by himself. But stand thou still a little while, that I may show thee the word of God. First Samuel chapter 10. Then Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? Wow. You know, that's what it meant to be anointed. In the Old Testament, they would anoint you with oil. In the New Testament, to be anointed, they were anointed with the Holy Spirit. And olive oil, oil was kind of a shadow of the spirit to come. You ever heard of them always saying, uh, you know, oil for the lamp, you know, and the lamps would burn giving light. It's a shadow, you know, a lot of shadows in the Old Testament pointing to the new. That's why people tell me, you know, oh, a bunch of shepherds wrote the Bible, you know. No, <laughs> that well, they might have, they might have penned the words down, but uh, the Bible says that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And I absolutely believe that. Verse two, 
Samuel saying to uh, Saul, When thou art departed from me today, then thou shalt find two men by Rachel's sepulcher in the border of Benjamin at Zelzah, and they will say unto thee, The asses which thou wentest to seek are found, and lo, thy father hath left the care of the asses, and sorroweth for you, saying, What shall I do for my son? You know, father's like, you know, I sent him to go look for these these animals, and my son's been gone. What happened to him? Where is he? Did a bunch of thieves kill him, or what? Verse 3, Then shalt thou go on forward from thence, and thou shalt come to the plain of Tabor, and there shalt meet thee three men going up to God to Bethel. And that word Bethel, do you know, you know what that means? House of God. Beth means house, and El has reference to God, Bethel. So one carrying three kids, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a bottle of wine. And they will salute thee and give thee two loaves of bread, which thou shalt receive of their hands, and that thou shalt come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines, and it shall come to pass, when thou art come thither to the city, that thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery and a tabret and a pipe and a harp before them, and they shall prophesy. What's a tabret and a pipe? A uh, pipe is a wind instrument, you know, like a flute, a uh, tabret, you know, harp. So they're coming down with musical instruments playing stuff. Verse 6. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon Saul. And thou shalt prophesy with them, and shalt be turned into another man. Wow, Saul's going to be turned from a, a man of the earth into the man of the Spirit. And let it be, when these signs are come unto thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry till I come to thee and show thee what thou shalt do. And it was so when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart, and all those signs came to pass that day. Gave him another heart. Huh, where have we read that before? Hmm. Well, in Ezekiel 11:19, and I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and will give them an heart of flesh. Ezekiel 18.31 Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? Ezekiel 36.26 A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit. And I will put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. All right, First Samuel 10.10 10. And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. And it came to pass, when all that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets. Then the people said one to another, What is this that is come unto the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? And one of the same place answered and said, But who is their father? Therefore it became known a proverb, Is Saul also among the prophets? And when he had made an end of prophesying, he came to the high place, and Saul's uncle said unto him and to his servant, Whither went ye? You know, where, where did you go? And he said, To seek the asses. And when we saw 
that there they were nowhere, we came to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, Tell me, I pray thee, what Samuel said unto you. Now remember, Samuel's the, uh, the big prophet. And Saul said unto his uncle, He told us plainly that, that the asses were found. Okay. But of the matter of the kingdom, whereof Samuel spake, he told him not. You know, he didn't tell him about how Samuel had anointed him with oil and told him he was going to be, you know, king or captain. And Samuel called the people together unto the, uh, unto the Lord to Mizpah and said unto the children of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all kingdoms and of them that oppressed you. And ye have this day rejected your God, who himself saved you out of all your adversities and your tribulations. You know, tribulations, trouble. And ye have said unto him, Nay, but set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. So they're going to line up by tribe. And the Lord's going to pick who's going to be king. Spoiler alert, we already know, right? Yeah. Now remember, the Lord himself selected Saul, both of them. He selected Saul the king. He selected Saul of Tarsus. To be an apostle. I don't care what the Hebrew roots people say. I don't care. Because they don't even believe in Jesus. Their Messiah is Yeshua. And Yeshua is going to be coming. And he's going to present himself in the temple of God. Showing himself that he is God. Yeah. And he's going to have his false prophet. But, uh, and by the way, that's going to be my next study when I finish this one. Yeah. Well, God willing. Verse 20, 1 Samuel 10, 20. And when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was taken. All right. So there's 12 tribes and they took, he took, he picked Benjamin. And when he caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was taken, and Saul, the son of Kish, was taken. And when they sought him, he could not be found. Therefore they inquired of the Lord further, if any man should yet come thither. And the Lord answered, Behold, he hath hid himself among the stuff. So here it is, Saul is hiding. You know? And they ran and fetched him thence from where he stood among the people. He was higher than any of the people from his shoulders and upwards. So he was, he was a tall guy. And Samuel said to all the people, See him whom the Lord hath chosen? There is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted and said, God save the king. God save the king. Where have I heard that before? Oh, that's right. They say that is a common thing in, in England. Of course, they've had a queen for the last, I don't know, what, 70 years, whatever. Yeah. Don't ask me about the royal family. Um, God save the king. Then Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. And Saul also went home to Gibeah, and there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. But the children of Belial said, How shall this man save us? Uh, Belial, it means worthless. Children of Belial, worthless children, said, How shall this man save, that, save us? And they despised him and brought him no presents. But he, Saul, 
I mean, yeah, Saul held his peace. All right, so quite a story, huh? Now, something you should know. Saul was humble in the beginning. I mean, he hid himself because he knew he was going to be picked to be the, the king of Israel, you know? And at first, he started off really, really good. But then towards the end, uh, I mean, King David fought Goliath because Saul was, uh, you know, Saul didn't want to face Goliath. So David did, and, you know, Saul let him. And then when Saul knew that King David was going to be the future king, he tried to kill David, chased him all over the place. You could read the Psalms. Psalm, you know, David wrote some of those Psalms when he was running for his life from Saul. I mean, here it is. David helped save Israel, and Saul's trying to repay him by killing him. And then, um, not only that, but his one of his last acts is to inquire of the witch at Endor. I, you know, so Saul started off good and ended up bad. How about Paul, Saul the Apostle? Well, Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus started off bad, killing the church. And then he becomes Paul the Apostle. So he's like the opposite. He starts off bad and ends up being good. So let's take a look at Paul, Saul of Tarsus. All right, let's read about uh, Saul. Let's go to Acts chapter 9. You know, those that deny Paul, do you know, they have to deny the book of Acts. I mean, really? Oh, I'm smarter than the, you know, people for the last almost 2,000 years. You know, oh, Acts doesn't belong in the Bible because it tells you about the story of Paul. Oh, it's fake. It's all fake. You know what? Let them go to hell. I don't care. I Really, I'm at that point. I don't care. You think you're smarter than all the people that put the Bible together? Oh, the Vatican put the Bible together. They got hidden books. No, they don't. You know what? You know who put the Bible together? The Greek church. The Greek church did. Rome had a representative there, but they didn't decide what went in the Bible and what didn't. The Greek church did. Godly men that paid for their faith with their lives oftentimes. Yeah. That's the people that uh, put it together. Let's take a look at 2 Peter real quick. All right, let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 14. All right, for 2 Peter 3, 15, 14. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation our Lord my my note here our Lord suffers a long time with some of us to for our salvation I know he put up with me for a lot of years. I'm surprised he didn't kill me out of hand. I, really. I mean, he waited for years. And uh, some people just reject it altogether. So the Lord suffers for a long time. So let's read 15 again. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation even as our beloved brother Paul. See, these Hebrew roots devils, Paul haters, they'll tell you, oh, 2 Peter's wrong too. 
So not only does the book of Acts wrong, but 2 Peter's wrong too. You see, they're experts. They know more than all the people for the last 2,000 years before them. They're smarter than everybody. Oh, Paul's false apostle. Yeah, well, Peter knew who these people were. An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Paul was given wisdom. As also in all his epistles. What's an epistle? It's a letter. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. Is some of Paul's writings hard to understand? Absolutely. In which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest or wrestle, as they do also the other scriptures under their own destruction. Do you get that? Did you understand what this just said? People that deny Paul are unlearned, they're unstable, and they wrestle Paul's scriptures and the other scriptures under their own destruction. Because they reject Paul, they reject Jesus who sent Paul, and they reject God the Father that sent Jesus. So they don't have Paul, they don't have Christ, and they don't have the Father. They can all go to hell as far as I'm concerned bunch of wolves. Paul gave a lot of warnings to the church, and they want to hide that from you. They want you to throw all Paul's warnings away. In which some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Yeah, no wonder they don't like Second Peter. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know that these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, yeah, the Hebrew roots and the Paul haters, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Yeah. So what are we going to do? Throw away 2 Peter? Throw away the book of Acts? Throw away all of Paul's writings? What's left? Not much. Not much. When people say, oh, it's not the same. Well, unlearned and unstable. That's what they are. Unlearned. In other words, when it comes to the Bible, they're dumb. All right, Acts chapter 9, verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round of uh, round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus. I am Jesus, not I am Yeshua HaMashiach. No, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembled and astonished and said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Wow, can you imagine? I mean, I didn't have something quite like this, but I don't think it was that far off. Well, I didn't have a bright light, but... You know, I was healed of an incurable disease. In the name of Jesus, it wasn't Yeshua HaMashiach. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember that night. 
Lord, what will thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. Uh, I wonder if the high priests uh, asked these men what they saw and heard, and what the story they gave them. You know, you wonder. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus, and he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. Saul was blind. The Lord had blinded Saul. And that's what Judaism is. It's blindness. And what did Saul do? He wouldn't eat and he wouldn't drink. He was fasting. He was repentant. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. See, Saul's eyes are going to be open to the truth of the gospel, the light of the world, from darkness to light. 13. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem, and here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. Uh, sounds like Ananias is trying to get out of this assignment here. You know, it's like when the Lord wanted to send Moses to uh, the children of Israel to lead them out, he's like, uh, yeah, but Lord, you don't understand. I I'm not a good speaker. <laughs> I I'm probably going to cover that story. We're going to probably cover that. I this would make a good, uh, yeah. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way. For he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. You see, Paul was a chosen vessel of the Lord. Unless, of course, you want to throw away the book of Acts. You know, why not? Just throw the whole Bible away and then follow the Yeshua HaMashiach or whoever. And then you could take his mark, 666, in your right hand or in your forehead when the time comes, if we live that long. Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. You know, Paul suffered greatly for the name of Christ. Greatly. I mean, if he was a fake, you wouldn't do that. I mean, really. But, uh, you know, these Paul haters, they're, they're, I don't know, they're devils. Period. My In my book. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto you in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And no, Paul didn't go to the Benny Hinn revival to get the Holy Ghost. Uh-uh. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was 
baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on the, this name in Jerusalem? And he came thither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? Yeah, how's that for a testimony? Yeah, I came here to kill Christians, but now I'm preaching Christ crucified, Christ the Messiah, Christ, Jesus is the Christ. And by the way, Christ is Greek for uh, the anointed, if I remember correctly. It's not a name. His last name is not Christ. It's a title. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews. Paul, Saul confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. And after that, many days were fulfilled. Guess who took counsel to kill him? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm afraid to say this on uh, uh, certain platforms with a large audience. Yeah. The you know who's took counsel to kill him, but their lying await was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down by the wall in a basket. Well, guess what? How did the uh, daughter of Pharaoh, how did she find Moses? He was in a basket in the, in the river while she was, you know, she, she, she took him out of a basket. Well, Saul, Saul was let down the wall in a basket. Oh, yeah. So let's read Exodus 2 real quick. Verse 1, And there went a man of the house of Levi, and took his wife, and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. Now remember, Pharaoh had said all the males born to Israel were to be thrown into the river, killed. You know? That's why when God killed all the firstborn he was just returning the favor you know the the passover verse three and when she could no longer hide him she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink and his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him and the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child. Behold, the babe wept, and she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew, and she, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses, because, and she said, Because I drew him out of the water. And then in 2 Corinthians 11, 32, um, we read Paul saying, In Damascus, the governor under Aretas the king kept the city of the Damascian, Damascan, Damascenes with a garrison desirous to apprehend me. So there was a garrison of soldiers that the king of the city was trying to 
grab Paul. Verse 33, and through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. There you go. All right, let's go back to Exodus 2, verse 11. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, that he went out unto his brethren and looked on their burdens, and he spied an Egyptian smiting an Hebrew, one of his brethren. And he looked this way, and he looked and that way. So he looked around, because <laughs> he's getting ready to do something here. And when he saw that there was no man, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. So he looked around, make sure there was no Egyptians, and then he killed the Egyptian that was striking the Hebrew. And when he went out on the second day, behold, two men of the Hebrews strove together. So two, two men are arguing, two Hebrew men are arguing. And he said to him that did the wrong, Wherefore smitest thou thy fellow? And he said, Who made thee a prince and a judge over us? You know, he's telling this to Moses. Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Intendest thou to kill me as thou killest the Egyptian? Oh. And Moses feared and said, Surely this thing is known. Now when Pharaoh heard this thing, he sought to slay Moses. But Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh and dwelt in the land of Midian. And he sat down by a well. All right, let's take a look at some. In Acts 7.22, we read, And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. Well, if you're raised up in the king's court as a son, yeah, you're going to get a first-class education. I mean, absolutely. You know, kings are supposed to be rulers. They have to know lots and lots and lots of things. All right, let's read Acts 22. Verse 1. Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. So here it is. Paul is proclaiming Christ to the Hebrews. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silent, and he saith. So you got to realize, Paul could speak, Paul knew Hebrew. Absolutely. Uh, there's another place in, where um, it mentions that Paul, a uh, Roman soldier asked Paul if he knew Greek, and he spoke to the Greeks. You know, you think Paul went to all these Greek cities preaching the gospel and he didn't know how to speak Greek? I mean, that's stupidity if you don't believe Paul could speak Greek, which was the common language of the, of the world at that time. I mean, it was common. Uh, Alexander the Great had conquered basically almost the whole known world at that time. And Alexander was a Greek. Uh... It's just the way it is. I mean, if you were an educated person, you knew Greek. If you wanted to be in business, you had to know Greek. But uh, when Paul was conversing with the Romans, I'm sure he spoke Latin. After all, Paul was a Roman citizen. And you better know the language of your citizenship. You should tell that to the Cubans in Miami, though, but uh, never mind. So, and when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept the more silence. And he saith, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, yet brought up in the city at the feet of Gamaliel. And we're going to read a little bit about Gamaliel. Gamaliel was a very famous rabbi. I've read some of his writings, actually. So, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers and was zealous toward God as ye all are this day. 
And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. As also the high priest doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders, from whom also I received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound unto Jerusalem for to be punished. And it came to pass that as I made my journey, and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. And I fell unto the ground and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there it shall be told thee of all things which are appointed for thee to do. And when I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked up upon him. And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And it came to pass, when I was come again to Jerusalem, even while I prayed in the temple, I was in a trance, and saw him saying unto me, Make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. Imprison and beat in the synagogue, the Christians. Read Matthew 24. That's coming again, contrary to the pre-trib rapture crowd. Do you know, I've been told to leave Baptist churches because of the pre-trib rapture. Do you know to them that's an essential doctrine? Oh, you got to believe in Jesus and the pre-trib rapture or you're not saved. I've had people tell me that. Where's that in the Bible? Yeah, it's in the Gospel of Judas, chapter 66 and verse 6. Thou shalt believe the pre-trib rapture in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Yeah. Devils. I'm sick of devils. Verse 19, And I said, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death, and kept the raiment of them that slew him. And he said unto me, Depart, for I will send thee far hence unto the Gentiles. So he's telling him, Get out of Jerusalem. I'm going to send you somewhere else. And they gave him audience unto this word, and then lifted up their voices and said, So everybody's listening, and then, their change their mind and they say away with such a fellow from the earth for it is not fit that he should live away with him away with him and as they cried out and cast off their clothes and threw dust into the air the chief captain roman soldier i guess commanded him to be brought into the castle and bade that he should be examined by scourging that he might know wherefore they cried so against him so they're getting ready to, to torture him, to, you know, whip him. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by. So here is Paul's talking to the Roman soldier and said, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? So wait a minute, you're going to whip me, a Roman sold, uh, a Roman citizen? That hasn't been convicted of any crime? 
When the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, Take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. You know, pay attention to what you're doing. This guy's a, a citizen of Rome. And I'll guarantee you, he's speaking to them in perfect Latin, the language of Rome. I will guarantee Paul was speaking to him in perfect Latin. Latin language, not broken, probably perfect. Then the chief captain came and said unto him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? And he said, Yea. And the chief captain answered, With a great sum ob obtained I this freedom. And Paul said, But I was free born. Then straightway they departed from him, which should have examined him, and the chief captain also was afraid, after he knew that he was a Roman, and because he had bound him. Oh, yeah. On the morrow, because he would have known the certainty, wherefore he was accused of the Jews, he loosed him from his bands, and commanded the chief priests and all the council to appear, and brought Paul down, and set him before them. So, here you got your uh, account of Paul. Oh, uh, let's read Acts chapter 5. We're going to read about Gamaliel, but we're also going to read about the apostles doing uh, miracles and stuff. Acts 5.1 But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. A uh, little bit of the backstory. Uh, everybody had everything common back then. People were selling their possessions and distributing it to the poor. So, so Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold something and kept back part of the price. His wife also being privy to it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. I mean, it, you know, it, it was your property. You know, don't say, oh, well, I sold it for 10000 when you sold it for fifteen. You know, you're, you're not lying to me. You're lying to God. And Ananias, hearing these words, verse 5, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out, and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after, when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in, and found her dead, and carried her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. Lying, you know, messing around with God is not something like to be, you know, played around with. And, yeah. Verse 12. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people, for they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Signs and wonders. They're doing miracles. They're healing people. They're doing similar things to what Christ was doing. <clears throat> Uh, verse 13, and of the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. For believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, 
and they were healed every one. They weren't going to the rabbi to get healed. No, they were going to the apostles to get healed. And um, if I believe the number one thing that Jesus healed in Scripture was casting out unclean spirits, the devils, the demons. Yeah, you know, how many people are in psychiatric wards because they're possessed of devils? Uh, you know, how many people in Congress and these big businesses are possessed of devils? Probably a lot more than we know. Verse 17, Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. What is indignation? Extreme hatred. Yeah. Yeah, you know, the sick people, are they, they're not going to the, the rabbis to get healed. They're going to the apostles. And the rabbis are like, dude, these guys are are cutting into our business here, you know. And so the, the 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 sect of the Sadducees, which is just a denomination of the Jews, all right, verse 18, and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go. So here it is, and the angel's telling them, Go, stand and speak in the temple, to all the people, all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came, and they that were with him, and called the council together, and all the senate of the children of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly we found shut with all safety, and the keepers standing without before the door. But when we had opened, we found no man within. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, they doubted them whereunto this would grow. Now wait a minute. You, you guys say you went to the prison, there's guards, but there's nobody in the prison. What's, what's up with that? Verse 25. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Yeah, you guys locked them up in prison, but they're, they're in the temple teaching. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence. For they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. And no, they didn't get some skunk weed. Yeah. You know, all the people had more brains than the leaders that were highly educated. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? Didn't we tell you, don't be preaching Jesus? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Well, if the shoe fits, wear it, right? Didn't you? Weren't you the guy screaming to the pilot to have him crucified? It wasn't us. It, wasn't it you? Yeah. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Verse 30, The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Not Rome. Paul, Peter's not talking to the Romans here. He's talking to the Sadducees, the priests. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Hmm. And you know what? You got a whole bunch of people that will say, 
that if you obey the Lord, they call that lordship salvation. They, and, and they'll accuse you of trying to earn your salvation by being obedient. Yeah. Yeah, they want, you know, if, you, uh, if you're a hitman for the mafia and you believe in Jesus, don't worry about it. You can keep that job. Keep being a hitman for the mafia. No problem. I mean, because if you try to keep the commandments, you know, thou shall not kill. Why? That's earning your salvation. That's lordship salvation. That's a heresy, they'll tell you. Yeah. Uh, you know, did you know grace is a license to sin, according to them? All you got to do is believe in Jesus. Well, I suggest they read James chapter 2. You know, your works are proof of your faith. You know, if you believe in Christ, you're not going to be a hitman for the mafia. You know, but they try to turn that around. Oh, well, you're, you're not going to be a hitman for the mafia so you can earn your salvation. I, you know, people are idiots. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. And when they, the you-know-whos, heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. Yeah, we don't like what they're saying. We're going to kill them. Verse 34, listen to this. Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel. Remember, Paul sat at the feet of Gamaliel. And according to legend, Gamaliel became a believer in Christ. I don't know if it's true. The Bible doesn't record that, but it makes for a good story, right? Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel. Oh, I should bring... Uh, in the Bible, the difference between the Pharisees and the Sadducees the Sadducees only accepted the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They were, they didn't believe the Psalms. They didn't believe Ezekiel or Jeremiah or Isaiah. They don't believe in angels. They don't believe in the resurrection. Whereas the Pharisees did believe in angels and in the resurrection. And so they're just different denominations of the Jews. So, then stood there up one in the council of Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people. So Gamaliel had a, a good reputation and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. Uh, yeah, take these guys and put them over there. I'm going to speak to you guys in private here. And said unto them, Gamaliel speaking, Ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves. Pay attention to what you're doing here. Take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose up Thutis, boasting himself to be somebody to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who was slain, and all, as many as obeyed him, were scattered and brought to naught, brought to nothing. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing and drew away much people after him. He also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. You know, leave these guys alone. For if this council or this work be of men, it will come to naught. You know, if... if the apostles are doing the work of men, it's going to come to nothing. But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it. If these works are of God, you can't stop it. Lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. Yeah. Yeah, if they're doing the works of God, are you going to fight against God? So leave these guys alone, and if this is not of God, it'll, it'll fizzle out. 
But if it is of God, do you want to be on the wrong side? Think about it. Verse 40, and, and to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Yeah, okay, we're not going to kill you, but we're going to beat you and tell you not to preach in the name of Jesus. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Tell that to the pre-trib rapture Baptist church people. Oh, we're the pre-trib rapture people. We're too good to suffer. God would never, never allow his bride to be beaten up. We're the bride of Christ. God's not a, 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 a wife beater. Idiots. And daily in the temple and in every house, they seek not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. So Paul was brought up at the feet of Gamaliel, a man that had a fantastic reputation, a doctor of the law. I don't, I don't know if you know what a doctorate degree is. You get out of high school, you go to college for four years, you get a bachelor's. Two more years, you get a master. Two or three more years, and you get a doctorate degree. I mean, you're talking serious education. You're talking eight years of formal studies to get a doctorate degree. Yeah, it's a lot of work. And this guy probably, you know, from a youth. All right, here's the difference between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Acts 23, 8. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. See, the Sadducees basically were the Levitical priesthood. They were the ones that did the animal sacrifices and what have you. And the Pharisees were the ones that taught the law. Well, a lot of man-made laws, but yeah. And what kind of sad religion is no resurrection when you die that's it i mean that's why they were sad you see but they don't believe in angels really oh wait a minute didn't we read about angels uh moses at the burning bush uh yeah but you know hey when you make up your own doctrines hey don't worry about what the bible says you know you just Make it up as you go along. I don't know. Oh, well, what are you going to do? But, uh, so that was the, uh, the Sadducees and the Pharisees were kind of battling for power. But when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, by the Romans, by the way, because the, uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees rebelled against Rome because they wanted to bring in their messi messianic age. Uh, once the temple was destroyed, the Sadducees had nothing to do. So they basically disappeared from history. I wonder if some of them became Pharisees. I don't know. Or if they gave up their faith or whatever. But uh, Jesus sent a message to them when the temple was destroyed, you know. Oh, and another interesting tidbit. The Romans and the Babylonians destroyed the temple both times on the same exact day. I mean, obviously years apart, but on the anniversary of the same day. I mean, what a coincidence, right? Oh, yeah. So, all right, well, we've done uh, over an hour, and uh, I think this is, yeah, part three. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' precious name, amen.